So good evening. Tonight's talk is uh, actually one where I first came up with the title many years ago, and then I had to figure out what I was going to say about the title. I couldn't resist the because uh, it was back in the, the dot com uh, revolutionary years when people were making and losing fortunes, and I realized that in Hebrew, dot com, right, means consciousness that somehow is settled and calm. And so I figured that deserves a talk on the topic of inner peace. And so what I wanted to at least start off with tonight is thinking about what this word means. Because we know that uh, in our culture, we wish, we wish each other shalom. That's the most common greeting. We say shalom aleichem. We wish people shalom. We say shabbat shalom. We're always talking about peace. It's the most common uh, greeting that we have in our culture, and the question is, what are we really wishing people? What are we really wishing people when we wish them peace? I don't think that it's really a wish that they don't get into a fight over a parking spot tonight. I don't think it's really a wish that these people don't get attacked by anti-Semites when they come out of the lecture, God forbid. I think that what we're talking about when we speak about shalom here is really an inner peace. We wish people Shabbat shalom wishing them an inner peace. And the question is, what does this mean? What do we really mean when we're talking about inner peace? And I think that it's important for us to understand what it means and to understand what it doesn't mean. I think it's important for us to avoid a faulty understanding of this concept. Something like this unfortunately happened to Rabbi David Goldman a number of years ago. He took a survey that was published in Time Magazine the survey was called, Are You Spiritual? And he had to answer a number of questions. And at the end of the survey, Rabbi Goldman scored a total of two out of 20. That's pretty bad. And they assessed him. The Time Magazine uh, had a way of assessing the scores. They sized Rabbi Goldman up as someone who was highly skeptical and resistant to developing spiritual awareness. He was very surprised. He's a rabbi. He's spending his whole day in spiritual pursuits. And Time Magazine had him scored as a, as a total failure. So he realized that this could be explained if you would just look at the way that the survey framed its questions. For example, here are a few of the questions that they asked on this survey. Number one, do you seem often to be off in another world? Two. Do you often lose awareness of time? Three, do people see you as absent-minded? And after reading these questions over again, Rabbi Goldman realized that they were not really testing for spirituality, they were testing for flakiness. And so the question is, when we're talking about any issue, do we really have a clear understanding, a clear definition of what the issue is? So we want to begin tonight with a small caveat about this topic of inner peace. Rabbi Adin Steinsaltz offered a very important sobering thought for us. He said that really when you think about it, in our society, tranquility and relaxation and peace are really seen as the most important goals of life. They're seen really as the priority we should have in life, to somehow pursue a life of tranquility and inner peace. And he said there's a huge industry, when you think about it, people spend billions of dollars in different ways to achieve this kind of tranquility. And it's true that our rabbis said that God found no vessel but peace that can contain life's blessings. So it seems that peace is an important thing. Rabbi Steinsaltz points out that it's true, that peace is able to contain blessing. Peace is able to contain blessing, but it can also be an empty vessel and contain nothing at all. And that's the caveat I wanted to begin with tonight. You see, when peace has no content, when there's no real content to the peace, it's basically a very empty vessel 
of meaningless tranquility. The pressure and the tension might be gone, but nothing positive has taken their place. And this is what we call decadence. This is basically decadence. Koheles, Shlomo HaMelech in his wonderful book, Ecclesiastes writes, better a living dog than a dead lion. Meaning that as long as in our lives there's activity and struggle, that's far better than a life with an empty tranquility of escape. Escape is not what we're looking for when it comes to achieving inner peace. So the question is not so much how to escape the struggles of life, how to make sure our lives don't have struggle, but rather what form to give our struggles and how to wage these struggles. That's really what we're looking at tonight. Rabbi Yisrael Salanter, who was the initiator, the, the, the primary driving force behind the Musar movement of the 19th century, said something very startling. Rabbi Salanter said, as long as one lives a life of calmness and tranquility in the service of God, it is quite clear that he is remote from true service. I want to repeat that so you can digest it. Rabbi Salantra said, as long as one lives a life of calmness and tranquility in the service of God, it is clear that the person is remote from true service. That can be a very disturbing thought when we think about it. And indeed, the Ramchal, Moshe Chaim Lutzato, in his classical work, the Mesil Yesharim, the Pathways of the Just, said that really our lives are defined by struggle and by tests. He said that God places us into a world of raging conflict. That's the way the Ramchal describes our lives. That's the way our lives are supposed to be. We were put into a world not of tranquility, God didn't create human beings and put them up in heaven where we can listen to harp music all day long. God put us into a world that Ramchal describes as one that's a raging battlefield. And that is the definition of our lives, going through these trials and tests and tribulations. It's interesting that we know in our tradition, we're told that Abraham had to undergo 10 trials, 10 tests. And you go through the Chumash, through the, the books, the early book of Genesis, you find he went through difficult situation after difficult situation. He was told he had to leave his family and leave his homeland and travel to an unnamed land. And he was constantly facing these difficulties. And when people try to figure out what was the last trial, what was Abraham's last test? So virtually everyone says the last test was the Akedah. The last test was when God asked Abraham to sacrifice his only child on top of a mountain. Abraham waited his whole life for this child. He finally has this child. And now God says, now take him and offer him up as a sacrifice. And that was a huge trial. That was incredible. It's almost impossible. And yet, Rabbeinu Yonah, one of the commentaries to Pirkei Avot, says, that wasn't the final test. Rabbeinu Yonah says there was another test after that. What was the, the tenth test, according to Rabbeinu Yonah? It was the ordeal of Abraham having to purchase a burial plot for his wife, Sarah, after the Akedah. We ask ourselves, what was he getting at? Isn't this a bit of an anticlimax? Abraham has just gone through this incredible test, the Akedah, having to bring up his son. And now Rabbi Yonah says, but wait, there's more. Another test. He has to buy a burial plot for Sarah. It's true he had to, had to handle, he had to deal with some unscrupulous people, but you're going to compare that to the Akedah? So what was he saying? Why did he tell us that this was the last test? And psychologically, it was very profound what he said. Because the truth is, every single one of us has this syndrome where we feel at some point, it's genug showing. I've done enough. I've put in my dues. And you can imagine someone that spent a life of 70 years, 80 years, 90 years 
of tremendous difficulties and trials and tribulations. And finally, they, they get this incredible test. They have to bring their son to be sacrificed. And Abraham passes that test. You can see how psychologically he could feel, okay, enough. I really put in my dues. I need to sit back and relax now, kick back, and just take it easy, go to Florida, and live the rest of my years, the golden years, without too many difficulties. We can understand how people would feel that way. And so Rabbeinu Yonah says no, that the message of these 10 trials is that even after the Akedah, Abraham has another trial, meaning it never ends, it doesn't end. And until the last breath we take, we are living a life of trials and tribulations. It's interesting that the Torah tells us that when they had the altar in the temple, in the Mishkan, where we brought all our sacrifices, this was the symbol of our spiritual life, you were not allowed to go up to this altar by steps. There had to be a ramp that went up on an incline. Why? Why was it important to have an incline and not steps? And the commentaries explain, you know why? Because when you're going up by steps, if you get tired, you can rest on one of the steps, take a few seconds, take a breather. But an incline like this, you really can't rest that easily. You've got to keep on going. So the message is that in our spiritual lives, we can't just be taking it easy sometimes and relaxing sometimes. It's a life of constant struggle, constant effort. As the Yisrael Slanter and the Musar masters would say, it's like being a bird. Once you start flapping your wings, you're going to fall down. So what is inner peace? What is this? It obviously does not mean that our struggles come to an end. But rather, inner peace is an inner quality that equips us to deal with these struggles. That's what we're dealing with tonight. A calm soul is one that's balanced, it's centered, it rides on even keel, and a calm soul is one that is calm regardless of what is happening around it. And with that kind of equilibrium, you're in control of your mind, and you have the freedom to encounter life's difficulties with grace, with bounce, and with joy. There are many examples I'll share two with you. At the end of his life, Rabbi Yisrael Salanter was in a big home, alone, basically his last moments of his life. And there was a man that was appointed to be his shomer. There was a man in the home that was basically going to be with him in his final moments. And he'd be the shomer, he'd be the watcher, watching over this dead body. And we're told that this watcher, this person that was with Yisrael Salanter, was extremely nervous. He was very upset because he had never been alone with a dead body before. And he was sitting here with Yisrael Salanter, who was basically dying, and he's getting very nervous. And you can imagine that Yisrael Slander could have turned to him and said, you think you got problems? I'm the one that's about to die. But we're told that Yisrael Slander spent the last moments of his life reassuring this person that everything is going to be okay. There's nothing bad about being with a dead body. Don't be afraid. And that's what this person of equanimity was able to do, to somehow extend himself in his moment of great pain and great tribulation and do something sweet and kind on behalf of someone in need. A more modern example, many of you heard this story, that in 1995, Malden Mills factory in Massachusetts burned to the ground. And the owner, Aaron Feuerstein, a religious Jew, spent millions of dollars to keep his 3,000 employees on full payroll with benefits until the factory was rebuilt. You can imagine that many people have gone, th having gone through an incredible tragedy like that, would fall to pieces, would maybe decide to close down the business, would certainly not think about their employees, would probably just say to them, listen, you're all going to have to go, it's the end of the job, finished. But he was someone that was able to somehow overcome this tragedy, think of others, and do the right thing. An incredible, incredible act on his behalf. So how do we build a life of equanimity? How is it possible to build for ourselves a solid foundation, a solid foundation 
so that we can go through life with this kind of even centeredness. When I was a student at Yeshiva University in the 70s, it was a very rigorous program because we had a full program. I was in a secular program studying for a degree in psychology and I was in a Judaic studies program. So it really was two full-time programs. We were very busy. It was a difficult school to be in. But for some reason they chose to insist that the students uh, also take physical education on top of everything else. So there were a few different options. You could play basketball, I think they had, and the, there were a few other things you could do. And they offered a karate class. They happened to have a teacher, Yeshiva University, professor of Hebrew, Chaim Sober, who was a very advanced black belt in karate. And uh, so many of us signed up for this class because we knew that we really didn't have to show up. And I didn't, I'm confessing now, but I didn't really go that often. But one thing that I attended that I'll never forget was each year he had a martial arts exhibition. And one of the things that they demonstrated was a technique called getting rooted, R-O-O-T-E-D. And basically what happened in this demonstration was that the smallest student he had, someone that was maybe 95 pounds, assumed a certain stance where they basically plant themselves, they root themselves on the ground, and then the six biggest people in the school tried to push this person over, to move them, to budge them, and they were not able to. I recently went on the internet and I saw a demonstration from China where a Tai Chi master was able to stand up against a line of about 20 people who were pushing him. It's an incredibly uh, powerful technique and very impressive to watch. And I saw this as a metaphor for a person that has a certain amount of inner peace and equanimity. They can go through life and they're not knocked over easily by outside forces. So the question is, how do we root ourselves? How do we get rooted in a way where life will not destroy us or upset us? So the great Chazon Ish, one of the great sages, who I think passed away in the 1950s in Israel, said the following in one of his letters. The Chazon Ish said that there is no sadness, there is no sadness when you live your life according to the light of truth. A very powerful statement. There could never be sadness to a person who lives their life according to the light of truth. What he's saying is that there is ultimately true contentment when you know that you're doing what you should be doing. If you're going through your life and you know, and you know that you know that you know that you're doing exactly what you should be doing it's very difficult for this person to be upset. And the question is, what should we be doing? What should we be doing with our lives? So we mentioned two weeks ago, what we should be doing is recognizing that our life is a building project. Our life is a life that's under construction. Someone once asked me, what denomination are you? I said, under constructionism. <laughs> Ultimately, we see the Baal Shem Tov teaches us based upon the story in the beginning of Bereshit of Genesis, where God creates everything unilaterally. God says, let there be light, and there's light, and God says, let there be camels, and there are camels. God is able to make everything unilaterally by declaring, let's make this, except for the human being. God says, let us make man. Let us make man. And the $64,000 question is, who is God speaking to? Let us make man. And the Baal Shem Tov explained that God is speaking to every single person who will ever live. God is basically addressing you and I. And God is saying to each of us, listen, Bubula, I cannot make you. I can give you your raw ingredients. I can give you a body and a soul. But who you become is ultimately a function of what you do with those raw ingredients. So God acknowledges he can't just say, let there be man. He has to say, let us make man, and God is speaking to every single one of us. And that's why, according to Rav Yosef Albo, 
If you follow the creation story, after everything that was created, God said, and he saw that it was good, and he saw that it was good, and he saw that it was good, except after the human being, it doesn't say that. Why? Because the answer is, it depends. It depends on what each of these people do with their potential. So you can't simply say that the creation of the human being was good because it hasn't been determined yet. We pointed out two weeks ago that according to the Maharal from Prague, that's why the Torah tells us that we were called Adam because we were created from the Adama. Adama is the earth. So the Adam, the man, comes from the Adama because just like the Adama, the earth, is pure potential. What happens to a plot of earth depends. It could lay there barren and produce nothing or it could become a very fertile field and produce wonderful plants and flowers and crops. But it depends on whether people are going to take care of this land, they're going to plow it, they're going to cultivate it, they're going to water it, they're going to fertilize it, they're going to do the kind of things that are necessary to produce plant life. And what's interesting is that this journey, this journey to create ourselves, doesn't cause happiness. It is happiness itself. The journey itself is happiness. It is fulfillment. It doesn't cause fulfillment. Interestingly, in Hebrew, the word for growth, someach, sounds like the Hebrew word for happiness, sameach. When is there sameach? When is there happiness? When there's tsameach, when there's growth. And that's the human condition, that we were put here to grow. We are put here to create ourselves. We are put here to build something, to make something. And if we constantly pay attention to that as we're going through our lives, I'm here creating a masterpiece. You know, it's amazing. There's a little tiny book that came out thousands of years ago that people didn't really know about until recently. It became suddenly very, very popular. You go to the bookstores, there are five, ten different editions of it with pictures, with commentaries. The little book is called Perak Shira. Parakshira chapters of song. And it basically lists about 90 different things that God created. It lists scorpions and tigers and bears and the sun and the moon and star. Every, I, you go through this book and it basically is a catalog of what God created. And the first time I picked it up, it was one that was illustrated with pictures and I'm looking through this beautiful book and I realized, you know what? There's someone missing from this book. There's no person there, there's no human being. So why isn't the person in the Parakshira? The Parakshira gives you the song that each of these creatures sings. It quotes a verse from the Psalms or from another book of the Bible. And this is the song of the scorpion. This is the song of the bear. So why wasn't there a human being in this book with the human being's song? And the answer is very simple. Because God cannot write your song. You've got to write your own song. Each one of us is different. So we have this word shalom, shalom which is peace, but it's related to the word shleimut, perfection, because ultimately we achieve inner peace, we achieve this kind of equanimity when we embrace the journey to work on ourselves and to perfect ourselves. The Vilna Gaon said that the entire purpose we were put onto this earth is to work on perfecting our character traits. Every one of us has a different combination of what makes up our personalities, different combinations of inclination towards being generous, or towards being humble, or towards being grateful, or towards being sensitive, or stingy. All these different aspects that make up our personalities, and some of us understand that we have challenges that other people don't have. Some people have a tremendous difficult time getting a grip on their anger. They have a bad, they're, they're impatient, and they get angry easily, and that could be the struggle of their life. How do I take control of this and get it under control? And for other people, they have no problem with anger whatsoever. The other person has a different, we say everyone has their own pecola, their own burden, their own package to deal with. And so each one of us was put in this world, according to the Vilna Gon, to perfect those things about us that need perfection. This is the directive that was given to our forefather, Abraham, when God said to him, Lech Lecha, 
What does lech lecha mean? Literally, go to yourself. Go to yourself. God says to Abraham, move along the path that will lead to revealing your true self. That's why each of us is here in this world. And so inner peace is not the goal of our lives. It's not the goal. But it's a byproduct of a life that's lived working towards the true goal of life. When we work towards this ultimate goal of creating ourselves, of perfecting ourselves, of building a real person, of growing spiritually, that's what ultimately produces as a byproduct inner peace. We all know that working on a building project can be energizing. I remember when I was 12 years old, I saw the movie The Bridge Over the River Kwai. An amazing, amazing film where you have these British prisoners of war, they're captured by the Japanese, and the Japanese force them to build this bridge. Now obviously this bridge was not good for the British troops, ultimately. It was good for the Japanese. But the British troops, the prisoners of war, were working on this bridge, and the basic plot of the movie is that while these British prisoners of war are building this bridge and they're beginning to take a pride in this bridge, look at what we're creating, this beautiful bridge, and they're getting into it, there are British commandos that are sent over to blow up the bridge. And so you see this tremendous tension at the end of the film where here they're building this bridge for the enemy and yet they seem not to want to have it blown up because this is their work, their creation. Everything they were doing for the last few years or months was put into this building project. And the exact opposite is also true. That when we're working and there's no benefit, when we're working for nothing, it's the greatest torture. That's why the rabbis tell us that Pharaoh had the Jewish people build the cities in Egypt on ground that was prone to earthquakes. Because that was the worst way of torturing us. Here we're going to break our backs to build these cities. And we know that any day an earthquake can come and the city's going to topple over. So the worst kind of pain is to know that all of our work and all our labor is for naught. It's demoralizing. We need to realize and recognize that the difficulties and obstacles of life are essential components for growth. We know that when we go to a gym to work out, how do we build our muscles? How do you get bigger muscles? By overcoming resistance. You don't get bigger muscles by picking up a piece of paper up in the air 500 times, even a thousand reps is going to shelf it. It's not going to help. You need to have resistance. You're going to pick up something that weighs 15 pounds if that's hard in the beginning. And you do that for a while and your muscles grow bigger. And then you make it 25 pounds and 35 pounds. But the way we grow physically is by overcoming resistance. And so the way we grow spiritually is by overcoming resistance. And therefore the resistance, the obstacles, are what causes the growth. That's why our rabbis tell us, this is going to sound shocking, that the greatest lesson that God, the greatest blessing that God ever gave us was Satan, Satan. Now we tend to think of Satan as the worst thing on the planet. Yet in the Bible, Satan is simply a word that means obstacle, roadblock, something that gets in the way. So in the tradition of Judaism, Satan is anything that obstructs our spiritual progress. Anything that gets in the way of our spiritual growth, that is what we call Satan, Satan. And we're told that that was the greatest blessing that God ever gave us because if we lived in a world where there were no challenges and there were no temptations and there were no obstacles and there were no roadblocks, we could never grow. So we have to realize that all of these difficulties in life, all of these temptations and obstacles are for our benefit. In the film that came out not long ago, The Matrix, people don't realize that there were really two matrices. The whole matrix premise was that there was a war between the computers and mankind. Mankind lost and now computers run everything. And what the computers do is they take human beings and they turn every person into a battery. Every person becomes a battery to, to, to give energy to the computers. And the computers basically put each person in a prison of a virtual reality program where each human being basically is living in this virtual world and the first matrix that we were put in was a utopia. Human beings were put into a world 
where nothing ever went wrong. Life was beautiful. You'd pass people on the street and they'd smile at you. And everyone would say good morning. And no one ever talked back to their parents. And it was a world where nothing ever went wrong. You know, uh, there's an old uh, science fiction show. Rod Serling had, what was his show? Uh, the, the Twilight Zone. One of the Twilight Zones, I think it was either Twilight Zone or The Outer Limits, was a show where this real miserable, nasty, creepy guy goes after he dies somewhere. He doesn't know where it is. He thinks he's going to heaven. So this was a kind of guy that was a, basically a, 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 a no good Nick. He spent his whole life womanizing and gambling. He shows up in this place, which is a Las Vegas the size of 10 West Edmonton malls. It's huge. He's in the hugest place in the world with billions of places to gamble, and there are cute waitresses for him to flirt with. And he's looking in this place, and he says, whoa, this is amazing. I, was, I couldn't imagine I'd be in a better place after I died. And he goes to the craps table, and he's gambling. He goes to the win, and every game he plays, he wins. And he wins, and he wins, and he wins. He's winning for two or three weeks. He finally realizes he's not in heaven. That's torture. In a place where you can't lose, you can't win. It's just a boring, meaningless experience. And so the first matrix that we were put into in this film was a place that was so perfect that the movie tells us that the human beings rebelled. We didn't want to live in a world where nothing could go wrong. We didn't want to live in a world where there were no challenges. And so they had a second matrix which was more like the world we're living in now, where there are bad people and or irritating people and annoying things that happen, and the kind of things that make our life meaningful because we have to struggle against them. We would ultimately choke in a world that had no challenges. Now the ultimate conflict in life, the ultimate arena of conflict, is in the tension between the two components of who we are. God created each of us with a body and a soul. And the body and the soul have very different agendas. The body basically would like the soul to understand that, you know what, life is a party, and life is about eating, and sleeping, and drinking, and having a good time, and feeling good. That's the agenda of the body. The body understands exactly what it wants. The rabbis refer to this as the part of us that's like a horse. What does the horse want to do? The horse wants to gallop and run and have a good time and eat, play. The horse basically is a horse. And then we have a soul, not the body, we have a soul. And the soul's agenda is to teach the horse, you know what, horse? There's more to life than just having fun. There's the possibility of meaning. There's the possibility of growth. There's the possibility of actualizing potential. There's the possibility of doing kindness to others, and the possibility of breaking our bad personality traits. These are things that the horse is totally not interested in. And so the rabbis teach us that we have this lifelong struggle between our body and the soul. Noah Weinberg used to always say that the body is very difficult to deal with. You see, the soul, Roy Weinberg would say, the soul really wants one thing, which is pleasure. The soul wants pleasure. And the body wants one thing, comfort. Rabbi Weinberg explained that in order for a person to really get pleasure out of life, they can't live a comfortable life. People often think that the opposite of pleasure is pain. Weinberg would say that the opposite of pleasure is comfort. Because in order to get pleasure, you need to invest energy and invest in pain. If you look at a relationship where a couple is truly fulfilled and truly in love, they've put themselves at risk in certain ways. They've been vulnerable to each other. They've had to do things that are not comfortable. A couple that's always smiling at each other and always giggling is living a very, very superficial life. So for a couple to really grow as a couple, it's not easy. It's often very painful. If you look at anything in life that's pleasurable, 
It requires an investment of energy and pain. If you take me to a museum, I can probably stay in the museum for an hour or two and then I'm getting a little bit antsy. All right, it's time to go. Take my wife to a museum and she can spend two or three days there. Why? Because she's an artist. She has worked on learning about art and learning about the history of art and learning about what these paintings mean and being able to appreciate it. She can get something out of it. I, who have done no work in the world of art, don't get as much out of it. And it's the same thing with anything in life. When I was a teenager, someone wanted me to play tennis. So I I'd play tennis for the first time in my life. After a half hour, I got bored because I, well, I, I wasn't good at it. I, I didn't really have any practice and I was just hitting the ball or missing the ball, but it was boring. But you find people that have practiced at tennis or anything and they love it and they can do it for hours and hours and hours and hours. And so what happens is we live in a world where our body prefers to be comfortable. The body prefers to be comfortable. The soul, though, really wants pleasure. The body doesn't feel like putting in the effort. So we live a life where if we have a friend in the hospital, God forbid, the soul is saying to us, you know what? You should go visit your friend in the hospital. It's the right thing to do. Your body says, hospitals are icky places. I don't really feel like going now. I'll go tomorrow. The body is always fond of saying manana. Tomorrow we'll put it off. I don't feel like putting in the energy of going now. But the soul wants to do the right thing. The soul wants truth. The body wants to be comfortable. If you insulted someone that you know, you insulted a good friend of yours, your soul says to you, you should apologize. You should go over to them and say, you know, I did something that was really, really wrong. I feel terrible. I apologize. Of course, that's what the soul wants. And your body says, eh, you know what? It's not a big deal. They'll get over it. You'll go next week. You'll go two weeks from now. But the body is not running to put itself into any situation where it's uncomfortable. The soul demands truth and the soul wants to be great and the body says okay you'll be mediocre great is not necessary so the great tension is between our body and our soul and the body wants to take over and the soul would rather take over and judaism says to us that we don't resolve this tension by ignoring the body that's not what we do we're not going to resolve this tension by ignoring the body or by surrendering to it. But the goal the rabbis teach us is to co-opt the horse. We don't want to kill the horse. We don't want to kill our bodies. We want to get the horse working for us. We want to get that side of us, which is physical, invested in what the soul wants. You think about it, there are so many things we run to do People get excited about going to a ball game. They're going to get there early and they're going to run and they're going to do everything. They're going to be so excited. They're going to look forward to it. People don't often look forward to going to synagogue in the same way. People already have to go to synagogue and schlep yourself there. You're not going to be 10 hours early. You're not going to wait online. People have to give stucca. You know, it's often very, we do everything to avoid the Mishulachim coming around. You know, we see them coming down the block. We're going to get out the back door of the house. There's so many things that our body runs to do, looks forward to do. How many people sitting in a synagogue at the end of the Shabbat service is thinking about what's going to be served for Kiddush? And we're beginning to drool already. We're thinking about what's going to be the chillant like and what the food's going to be like. We get very excited about that kind of stuff. And what's amazing is that our rabbis teach us that our body speaks to us in the first person. The body says, Oh, am I tired? I am tired. Oh, am I hungry? I am hungry. But the soul speaks to us in the third person. You know, you should get up to go to shul this morning. You should get up. Ah, I'm plotting to get up. That's this tension between our body and our soul, between what we say the horse and the rider. The rider wants to give the horse direction. And so the ultimate goal, again, is not to kill the horse, and not to totally give in to the horse, 
but to ultimately get the horse, get the body working for the soul. So that when we're going to do something that's spiritual, we do it with a tremendous amount of alacrity, with verve, with energy, with drive, with passion. The same kind of passion we have for lunch, we're going to have for going to a class. That's what life is all about. I'm going to share one more thought and then I'll have a few minutes for questions. When I was thinking about what to say for this topic of inner peace, I realized that there is ultimately a universal solvent. You know, in, in science, they try to come up with the universal solvent. Uh, the big joke is, what are they going to put it in? But the truth is that when it comes to inner peace, there is a universal solvent. There is one magical tool that produces instantaneous inner peace. And I really could have had the entire evening tonight focused on that topic, but we would have to actually have much more than a one-hour program. It's actually a very, very huge topic. I'm just going to touch on it very briefly. But the Chavos Lavavos, the famous work on Jewish spiritual inner growth, the Chavos Lavavos has an entire section dealing with bitachon, with trusting in God. And the author of the Chavos, Chavos Lavavo says that if you're able to cultivate a life of true bitachon, a life where you truly trust that there's a pilot that's running this world and that pilot loves you and that pilot is totally capable and that pilot has your best interests in mind, if you truly have that kind of a bitachon, a faith, a trust, then he says you will live a life of total tranquility and inner peace. They tell a wonderful story about a student of the Chazonish. The Chazonish had a student in Bnei Brak who owned a printing press. That was his parnasa, his livelihood was through this printing press. The story goes that one day he discovers that someone opened up another printing press very close by. So not too far away, someone opens up another printing press. So Rav Dov, the owner of the printing press, Rav Dov went to this new fellow and he greeted him very warmly. He said, welcome to the neighborhood. He said, if I could be of any assistance, please let me know. If your machines break, break, break down, I'll be happy to lend you some parts. Uh, I'll give you some advice on how to develop your client list if you'd like. He spent an hour welcoming this competitor and giving him advice and offering to be helpful in any way he can in the future. And they wished the fellow a lot of Hatzlacha, you should do well, and he went home. Vdov came home and his family asked him what, what happened when you went over to the competitor. They thought they were going to get into a fight or something. He explained exactly what he said. He said, I, I welcomed the person and I offered to my, to my help and my advice. And the family was surprised. Why were you being so generous to someone who could ruin your business? Rav Dov said that God has allotted my Parnassah for this year. God determines on Rosh Hashanah how much each of us is going to make for the year. And Rav Dov said that God has already determined how much money I'm going to make this year. I'm not going to get a penny less because this person opened up a business nearby. Actually, Rav Dov said, he might make my life easier by taking away some of my customers. I won't have to work so hard. I'll be able to spend more time with my family, more time learning Torah. I'm very, very grateful to this person coming in here and opening up another printing press. That's the kind of reaction someone could have if they have somehow developed this abiding trust, this bitachon, that God controls the world, God runs the show. God determines exactly how each of us is going to do. And we don't have to kill ourselves struggling to achieve all of these things. We've got to put in our hishtad lus. We have to put in our effort. But we don't have to kill ourselves. God did not have that as part of the equation. God said to Adam and Eve, by the sweat of your brow, you're going to eat bread. So God expects that each of us will put in some effort in order to make a livelihood. But God did not say that we're going to have to kill ourselves and work 15-hour days 
in order to have a livelihood. And so Rav Dov was someone who exemplified, who lived this incredible trust, this bitachon, this faith in the fact that there's a God that runs this world, that he trusts in, and if he has his trust in God, as we say in the book of Psalms, right, God is my shepherd, the Lord is my shepherd, and I'm not going to have to worry about anything. And he could lead me through the valley of the shadow of death. And somehow I'll be okay. I'm going to make it through. I'll tell you that the most inspiring thing for me personally, because I'm still trying to work on this, is when I meet someone that has this kind of incredible faith, this incredible trust in God, I just see in who they are on their faces and in their lives how incredibly peaceful they are in the most difficult, trying circumstances. And so I want to give each of us a blessing that if we are truly desiring to live a life of equanimity, of contentment, of tranquility, of inner peace, to seize hold of what the Torah advises us to do. Number one, to rise to the challenge of realizing that we are all under construction. We're all here to build ourselves, to make ourselves into something. And we will find tremendous contentment and joy and peace in doing that, knowing that we're spending every minute of our life doing something that we're supposed to be doing, that we're here to do, not wasting our lives. And to do this, to go through this project, having trust in God, that God loves us and God ultimately seeks and desires what's best for us, I think that there's no possible uh, way of describing that contentment and that joy and that inner peace.